Mars is very dusty and the dust seems to be very well mixed. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast brought by, to you by the Earth and Solar System Group at the University of Manchester. Uh, you're here with me, the, the almighty greatness that is Rick Viver here. And there's the other people as well, like Tom Harvey, Hello. Marissa Lowe, and Hello. John Fern- and Hello. John Pernifit. And John Bonifish. (laughs) Today we have a great guest for you all. We have Candice Bedford. So Candice, you're coming from all the way in America, but obviously you don't originate from there. I mean, people won't have got that from the high you did, but I know that. And you and I initially actually met at the Euro Planet, was it, in 2006? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah, 2000, yeah, 16. 16, yeah. yeah. First year and of both our PhDs, I think. Yes, yes. So we started at the same time. Um, and from that moment onwards, from when we met, I knew you were going to be my enemy. And um, <laughs> So it's good to have academic rivals, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Even though we do completely I mean, yeah. <laughs> no offense, <laughs> Ricky, but... <laughs> wow, okay. Right. Um so we should probably crack on with the episode and <laughs> I'll hold in the tears. Um, so, uh, Candice, you, we, you now work over at the LPI, uh, the Lunar Planetary Institute, uh, which is hosted by NASA, I assume. <laughs> um, um, it's USRA, it's the University of Space Research Association. Oh, okay. Right. It's the one who the LPI is kind of a branch of, um, but it works under a NASA cooperative agreement, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it's next door to Johnson Space Centre, basically, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and um, I'm contracted by them to work at the, non- uh, the NASA Johnson Space Centre. So uh, my office is there, and um, the labs I work at are there. But um, awesome. yeah, I'm associated with the, I'm an LPI scientist. That's really cool. How long, how long have you been there for now? Since um, 2019, so it's almost been a year now. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, wow. I moved here, yeah, 20th of June last year, so almost been a year. Crazy. That time has flown by. It's kind of flown and then been stagnant when the quarantine started and then it's gone mm-hmm. back again. <laughs> it's like a mix. So is there, uh, everything was still shut down then you're working from home, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're very much encouraged to stay working at home. Um, yeah, labs aren't open yet. So um, mm. I think there's been some discussion about opening things up again. Um, lockdown hasn't been as much of a thing over here, um, mm. but... Yeah, NASA and the LPI obviously want their um, members of staff to be safe and Mm -hmm. when it's safe to do so. So they're taking it seriously, which Mm -hmm. is good to know. And uh, so what was your path to get you to the position you're in now? Um, So I kind of never really planned to be a planetary scientist. (laughs) Um, I only figured out it was an option when I started finishing, when I was coming to the end of my undergraduate degree at Royal Holloway. Um, I chose geology mostly because I've always wanted to be like some kind of explorer. Um, I very much loved Lara Croft and Tomb Raider when I was younger. And I used to want to do archaeology and like run around old tombs. But then when I was considering doing classics at university, like I was still kind of, I lo- I've always loved science. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to give up like physics and chemistry. Um, and then I found out with geology, you can like travel everywhere and kind of have an exploration aspect to it. So that's why I chose geology. Then when I was coming to the end of my geology degree, I was wondering what I want, like, wanted to do. And then my friend pointed out that there were planetary PhDs about. And I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to like, I like, had never considered a PhD at all until yeah, half a year before my masters was finishing um, so yeah then I was like yeah maybe I'll apply and I'll see it'd be cool um, and yeah and then I saw the PhD opportunity at the Open University um, that involved looking at Mars and looking at um, like aqueous environments on Mars like that used to exist and, um, looking at the data from the Curiosity rover and I thought that was really cool so I applied and that's kind of where I've ended up now so there's never like an intention to do planetary. It's always just been, I've wanted to be an explorer in some way. And then, yeah, kind of just ended up me being here. 
doing the ultimate exploration on a, yeah. on a planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so obviously the listeners don't know, but yes, you work closely with the Curiosity rover and specifically the ChemCam instrument on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, my entire PhD was um, looking at the ChemCam data. So ChemCam is an instrument, um, you know how Curiosity has like a head, it's kind of on the head um, and it fires a laser uh, up to seven meters away from the rover mast. Um, Sometimes, it, I mean, it can fire it further away, but the data isn't as um, good when it gets returned. But it, fi it fires this laser um, at a geological sample, um, and you can get chemical data from the light that's returned um, to the instrument. So I spent my PhD looking at all the chemical data for the entirety of the Curiosity River Traverse. Oh, wow. I'm just trying to understand um, mostly what kind of different source regions the sediments could have come from and how they may have been altered through different ancient environmental processes like being transported in a river environment and a lake environment um, which is supported by what we see in the um, geology of the sediments in Gale Crater. Mm. Um, so yeah that's pretty much been my PhD. I'm now um, a member officially a member of the Chemin team so I've um, kind of moved instruments a bit, but I'm still very much working closely with ChemCam. Um, and my current postdoc is more planetary analog related now anyways, so right. um, less MSL, but I still do MSL things. So sorry, what did the ChemN team do? ChemIn is um, the, so ChemIn stands for chemistry and mineralogy. Um, and they look at the drilled samples. It, it uses X-ray diffraction to, and this, to look at the, um, what minerals are present in the drilled and scooped samples delivered um, into the rover body. So Kamen is housed in the rover body. Um, and so that's what Kamen do. That's awesome. So are you like one of the first people then to see some of this data as it's being beamed back to Earth? Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm part of the team, so I'm, I'm one of the first, some of the first people to look at it and interpret it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, particularly with ChemCam. Um, I, yeah, I still very much keep up to date with ChemCam stuff, and um, yeah, I'm still helping out, trying to figure, helping figure out what's going on um, with yeah, the ChemCam data that's coming back, yeah. and how it relates to previous units in particular. That's really cool. So, how how big are some of the teams that work on some of these instruments? Well, it's like there's a lot of people and they're spread all over the world. The ChemCam team is, has members in France, um, the US, UK, um, Denmark, all over the place. Um, and yeah, there's team members in Canada for different instrument teams. Um, That's I think awesome. Kevin, I might be the only, or one of the few, I don't think there's very many foreign nationals on Kevin, but ChemCam's definitely a huge international team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, brilliant. And you've got the Curiosity Science team must be over 100 or so scientists working on it. It's huge, huge international collaborative effort. Yeah, that's. I guess that's really important, isn't it? So it's despite the fact that it's a NASA-run mission or an American-run mission, it's still got this huge international presence. That's that's really cool. Yes. Yeah, ChemCam, Cam I think, is um, kind of yeah. It's it's got kind of like a the two main nationalities on ChemCam of is France and the US, like French and the Americans. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's really internationally run. And I think we've got the weather station on Curiosity, I think might be Spanish. Um, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's like just a huge, yeah, it's a national team. It's nice. Mm -hmm. So you said with our ChemCam that it collected data all along the rover's traverse. Um, that sounds like a, a lot of data, a lot of information. Um, what could you tell from all of that then about different Martian processes? Uh, you can tell loads. So ChemCam, because ChemCam, you just fire a laser at the surface. Um, it's very rapid analysis. So, and it doesn't take too much energy to do. So um, you get ChemCam measurements. You can get them like every other sol. Um, and yeah, there's been, Curiosity has been on the surface of Mars for over six years now, I think. Is it just major elements that ChemCam does, or does it trace elements no, as well? it does trace as well, but um, there's minor and trace, but I focus on the major element oxide mm -hmm. chemistry because the, um, they're better kind of understood. Mm -hmm. 
and the accuracies on them um, is be better understood. Um, so yeah, I focus on the major element oxides from ChemCam. -Chem. Um, my data set for my PhD ended up being about five, several thousand, like four or five thousand observation points. And each observation point constitutes like 30 to 50 spectral analyses and is averaged over that. Um, yeah, so it ended up being this massive data set. Um, and a diversity of geological targets is hit. So you have mudstones being targeted, alteration features such as um, nodules or calcium sulfate mineral veins that indicate that fluid used to mm -hmm. um, have moved through the rock and had this like kind of large scale mobilization of elements. Um, and so those kind of um, features are targeted and sand drifts are targeted, slopes are targeted, um, which are like large blocks of rock that don't really we don't know exactly stratigraphically where they're from, but they're on the surface. And so, yeah, you can, a lot of my PhD was sorting through the data, kind of classifying it. Um, and then once you have this broad classification and the sedimentologists of the, on the team obviously went through to give their sedimentological interpretations of each unit and mm. they group them um, stratigraphically. And so you have a, a rough idea of like the relative timing of these deposits to each other. So what I did was I sorted the post rock that didn't look obviously altered from that that was clear alteration features and just comparing those two to each other can tell you about the kind of aqueous alteration that happened mm -hmm. um, and whether or not your host rock has been significantly altered or not. Then if it hasn't been significantly altered by the same processes that means that the nodules or the sulfate veins, mm -hmm. then you can look at things to tell you more about paleoclimate, like um, chemical indices of alteration, which is um, looks at um, how some minerals, what elements might have been lost through um, minerals being chemically weathered, and that can tell you a bit more about yeah, like how weathered these samples are. So whether it was kind of like maybe warmer, warmer and wetter environment um, from at the source where these sediments were eroded from. Mm -hmm. And if the CIA values aren't substantially high, then you can also potentially think about and consider, well, there's also mineral sorting with sediments um, as they're transported, like the heavier sediments will be left behind and the lighter sediments will be transported further. And that can tell you a bit about like sediment transport um, direction. So one of my most recent studies is on the Stimson Formation, which is an ancient Aeolian deposit, so an ancient windblown dune deposit. Which I think um, we caught up with you about in one of yeah, our old LPSC yeah. vlogs, so we'll stick a link to that in the description if uh, anyone <laughs> in the audience wants to check that out. <laughs> yeah, so that work's been published now. Um, and we, yeah, we see quite nicely um, across this deposit, because it's it was formed after the ancient river and lake environments uh, had kind of ceased in Gale Crater, the environment was a lot more, a lot more dry. So CIAs and like substantially. You What's don't a CIA, much, sorry? The, the chemical indices of alteration. Right. So the um, sediments weren't substantially affected by chemical weathering. Um, and so you can actually, you, you, in this deposit, you, it's preserved the um, geochemical um, influence of mineral sorting. And mm -hmm. so from that, we've been able to kind of infer ancient wind direction um, using chemistry from ChemCam. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. so how important then are the terrestrial analogs for some of these, um, the rocks that you're trying to interpret? I mean, presumably you're trying, you're looking at, at these chemical signatures, but I suppose a lot of the processes that you infer from are based on observations of how we understand sediments to operate on earth. Yeah, so it is incredibly important. And yeah, like I said, my work now has moved a lot more onto planetary, understanding planetary analogs, because a lot of what we infer for the geochemistry, geochemistry and mineralogy and how that's affected by sedimentary processes on Mars is kind of from um, a literature on the earth that isn't as, most of our sedimentology on the earth is like from our more evolved crust um mm -hmm. so it's rich in quartz and feldspar but it doesn't have as much of the um like kind of the salt it's not it's not as basaltic as what mm -hmm. we see on mars just because yeah. of how the different planets have um formed their different crusts and so now part of my work is 
we are um, trialing some Mars 2020 operations scenarios um, in Iceland and also mm -hmm. at the same time investigating um, the sedimentary processes and the effects of physical and chemical um, weathering on different types of basaltic rocks in Iceland to try and help us help inform us more about what's happening on Mars. Because mm -hmm. yeah, a lot, a lot of what we're discussing on Mars is kind of like more theoretical. We haven't had any, um, there's not been many studies to 100% show that these hypotheses, these hypotheses are like, um, you know, there's nothing that's been obviously ground truth for some of them. And so we're kind of like working with the Sandy project. Um, to so that's the semi-autonomous <laughs> navigation of detrital environments. Too. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. Excellent acronym there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the next one is going to be, so we've got another field campaign planned, um, and I think the acronym might change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, we're hoping to try and, instead of it being semi-autonomous, run some complete autonomous um, scenarios. So I think it might change to Candy. <laughs> change because can, Candy is my nickname. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, so what did you literally do when you went out for the, uh, uh, the field operations before? So we went to a, a yeah, we, we went to the wilderness of Iceland, which is beautiful. Um, we were at the base of um, the Thorosiofiddle Glacier, um, which is a small glacier coming from this a long glacier called Longjökull. And Jökull in Icelandic means glacier. I think long means long. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what Thoros is. It might just be like Thor's glacier, actually. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So we, we were at the base of this beautiful glacier, which had this... Um, river running off it and then um there were also aeolian deposits because um when you have a glacier you get like kind of a strong headwind because of the like cooling effect of the glacier and then you get and so there were lots of um, wind deposits we had river deposits to look at. and we set up field camp at three locations at different proximities to the glacier so you had the proximal site that was like at the base of where the um, or as close as we could get to where the sediments were coming from, the, the start of the river. You had the medial site, which was, um, I think it was about, how far was it, like three, four kilometers away. And then we had the distal site, which was um, about 10 kilometers away from the start um, of the sedimentary system. And so at each site, we conducted six different field operations um, where we had, um, we have a rover, um, and a drone and we have this tent and the tent people inside the tent and there's a couple of scientists who sit in there and they are the ground control scientists so they, they represent earth um and they're the ones who um follow mission the mission scenarios and um send commands out to the rover to go and analyze different targets and stuff based on what the rover returns to them um the data products that the rover returns to them um, under the overall mission aim of understanding how the chemistry and the physical, um, how the sedimentary processes affect the chemical and physical properties of the sediments. Um, and so, yeah, so the day would be that we'd go through these different scenarios. Some of them had incorporated drone imagery. Some of them in, had varying levels of um, autonomous terrain classification um, and hazard terrain classification from the rover that had been developed by um, the Mission Control Space Services, which is a company up in Canada, um, who also developed the rover. Uh, and so it's just trying to understand um, how the different data products, like whether or not drone imagery would help um, or how it would help in um, a Mars rover um, operations and how it would help maximize science return. And the same with different levels of autonomy um, and how that would help the ground control scientists in reaching the um, mission aims, whether it would, you know, help them reach it faster or whether there'd just be too much data that they wouldn't be able to digest it um, in time to send out the commands. Um, and so, yeah, we had six different operation scenarios and we did them at each field site. We also con um, sampled, whenever we did a geochemical analysis, so we had portable um, XRF, which gets the bulk geochemical, um, geochemistry of whatever you target it at. Um, so a couple of, it's got like this kind of big, I think a couple of centimeter footprint. Mm. Um, so it gives you the chemistry of that. 
And then whenever we'd have like a portable XRF measurement taken, we would also like scoop up a surface sample and then dig a bit deeper. And so we ended up getting a lot of sediment samples to bring back to. And what I also did was I wandered around the volcanoes um, in the source area and I sampled them as much as I could do as well. So we understood what the initial host rock was that these sediments were eroded from. And we now have like this huge wealth of this massive sedimentary library um, taken at points where we know where they are along this sedimentary system um, and fully documented with all the rover imagery as well. So it's now just, yeah, we're going to tease apart all of these different mm. processes and hopefully understand more about what's happening on Mars and what we're seeing on Mars. Mm. Really fundamental stuff, really. Yeah, it's, it's fundamental. It's needed. Um, yeah. We need to try and understand these systems as much as we can be. <laughs> especially because that's what we're looking at over on Mars. So ideally, I guess in order to fully understand how Martian sediments would say compared to terrestrial ones, what, what sort of scale ideally would you want your data to be at to fully understand that? Oh gosh, well I have, yeah, different scales really. Like it's difficult because yeah, so you, You'd want, we were hoping for this next field campaign to conduct, do, do what we did last year, but over a larger system so we can get more like long distance effects of the sedimentary systems um, and take that into account. Um, so we kind of like, we, we want to try and be like as broad in terms of where our field locations are and, and like make sure we can look as far downstream as possible. But we also need to look at the like micro level. We, we, we are doing some micro XRF analyses, we do XRD, I'm going to be looking at these sediments and the volcanic rocks using the micro probe. Um, so we also want like, to understand what's going on at the micro level in these sediments as well because that influences what we end up seeing um, in any geochemical um, measurement at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so you kind of want to look at it at all scales. <laughs> Um, as big as you can and also as small as you can because yeah everything affects S sediments are messy <laughs> like sedimentology is a relatively dark art in itself and then you look at the geochemistry of sediments on another planet that you can't really get to <laughs> as well, then it's just, yeah <laughs> you need to understand try and understand everything that can influence it and will influence it do you nice. um where you're working with comparison to terrestrial analogs do you ever find in the data from Mars that you find stuff that doesn't match up to the analog or to what you might have expected kind of relative to the analog or is it kind of pretty accurate? I think, well, plants is one thing that we've got to be wary of in the analogs and the effect that that has on the geochemistry. So Iceland, where our field site didn't have many plants. Thankfully, that's part of the reason I was selected was to avoid as much life as possible. But um, there have been some occasions where there was a bit of moss or um, like some flowers and with plants come soil and then you have differences in like phosphorus and um, like carbon and sulfur and stuff. So that's something. Can, to can microbes make a difference as well? Yeah. Mm. So there are things to keep into, a, into account and to bear in mind when you're looking at the two different planets. Um, also, yeah, differences in climate. So the climate's not going to be exactly the same. Um, and in terms of the volcanic rocks, iron as a planet is a lot more iron rich than the earth. Um, and so this affects kind of the chemistry of the source rocks and the volcanic rocks that you see. So there are differences like that that you have to kind of take into account. Like the earth isn't in any, any planetary analog on the earth wouldn't be exactly the same as on Mars. Um, and so, so long as you understand the differences, then you can take that into account when you're making your interpretations. And so, yeah, there are, there are minor things like that. In terms of looking at the minerals um, and how they segregate and how they're affected by weathering, I think it's broadly similar, um, which is nice. <laughs> um, and it makes life easier, um, which is cool. But yeah. Uh, was it quite hard to find uh, a, a, 
the, a, a good location uh, on Iceland to try and look at the different sort of sediment, sedimentological features that you want to look at and have sort of the accessible source rocks nearby and all that. Or so I suppose you don't really think about sediments in Iceland that often, or so I certainly don't anyway. So was it was it quite no, challenging? We're not looking at in, we're not looking at old sedimentary systems. Um, I think trying to find old lithified sediments is very difficult in Iceland mm. because it's such a volcanically active place. But we're looking at currently active sedimentary systems mm -hmm. that may have existed on Mars in the past. Um, and because of the amount of glaciers there are on Iceland, and it's, it's it can rain a lot in there. Or you do actually the uh, center of Iceland is very dry, so you have a lot of alien processes um there are even though it's a relatively young country there are a lot of um, sedimentary processes going okay. our field site was selected last year based on and actually for the next campaign based on previous um analog work done in iceland so mm -hmm. we're trying to build from that um so i think in terms of selecting the site yeah the rationale being we want to build on what was previously but been done yeah. um has kind of like helped in the field site selection but yeah I, I visited Iceland many many times and there are loads of like huge rivers and um you have like these massive catastrophic like flood flood plains because of when you also get some glacial volcanism if that pocket of meltwater bursts like if, if it ends up like penetrating the glacier then it just all goes you have what's called a yokel cloud which is this huge just like flood of um water so you have you have some really cool sedimentary stuff going on in Iceland. You actually Probably. get similar things to that on Mars as well. Your outflow yeah. channels on Mars are similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so cool. uh, you're doing this study to basically see whether you can look at the sediment and infer where its original source was from. Is that correct? Yeah. So I like I've always liked volcanoes, um, and so I was a little bit disappointed when I did curiosity work <laughs> and there were no volcanoes in Gal Crater. It's just volcanic sediments. So I was like, no. Volcanoes. Um, so yeah, I tried my best to still include some um, volcanoes in my work. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to piece back what the initial. Um, oh, I I just every, uh, there's a lot of this this idea that Mars is very basaltic, and Mars is clearly very basaltic. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I think that like even if you have like like Iceland is also very basaltic crust. That's why we go there to do lots of planetary analogs. But you can get different kinds of volcanism occurring. You have like lots of, um, you have different magnetic processes and one being if a magma chamber sits around for a long time, you'll fractionate different minerals until eventually you get more, what's called like more of an evolved melt forming. So I guess I kind of then become, became interested in trying to find evidence of different kind of volcanism on Mars. Um, and Gale Crater is interestingly very mineralogically, it's, it's, it's got more mineralogical diversity than was expected, I guess, for Mars, because we found sanadine of relatively high order suggests more um kind of alkali rich volcanism mm -hmm. you also had thudamite which is a high temperature silica polymorph so like quartz but formed at higher temperature and that um is has been suggested to be from more of a, a like a very silica rich kind of very evolved kind of rhyolitic type volcanism mm -hmm. so the fact that we found these mineral deposits already like that that's just like different from bas like the standard basaltic mineral suite um, has been kind of eye-opening that Gale Crater, the crust around Gale Crater might be a lot more diverse than we, than what was originally thought when Curiosity got there. So the samples you're talking about, are they samples that have, are consolidated or are they like a sand on the surface? Is this for Gale Crater? Or yes, for, for Gale Crater, yeah. Yeah, so all of, uh, well, some are still sand dunes, mm -hmm. like the Bagnall sand dune deposits are currently active dune deposits. Mm -hmm. Um, still migrating on the surface of Mars, um, but the majority of the sediments that have been analysed have been um, sedimentary rock that's been lithified and we're mm. analysed in situ. And uh, how do you decipher that from, uh, how do you decipher whether that's something that has been blown over, so say an aeolian thing, because uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is obviously on Earth we know that wind can blow dust uh, thousands of kilometres, so um, say, for instance, the Sahara can blow dust all the way to America. And how do you know whether your source, uh, sorry, the dust you're seeing in Gale Crater isn't from loads of different areas of Mars because you get wind, uh, you get dust storms there all the time, blowing yeah. stuff over there and then it all gets consolidated over time. 
and lithifies. So I definitely think there's kind of like a global geochemical, well, a relatively global geochemical signature, which comes from like Mars. Mars is very dusty and the dust seems to be very well mixed. Um, and so at least like the current dust that we're seeing that's been deposited on stuff is like a very kind of like a relatively uniform signature because it's been very well mixed in this very dusty atmosphere over a long time. In terms of the past, um, well, we're not sure how dusty Mars was mm. in the past. Um, and I think particularly with the ancient Aeolian deposits, because they were dry dune deposits, it's not expected that you preserve the very fine fraction, mm. um, fine grain fraction in there, because it will just get winnowed away and stay in the suspension. Um, for the fluvial deposits, um, they're generally a bit more coarser grained. Um, and so I guess the dust could play to something for the fine grain lacustrine deposits. What, again, with this like bizarre tridomite rich unit, um, another idea was maybe you had some kind of volcanic, uh, a big volcanic eruption and it could have been carried like in a ash plume and maybe it was like some kind of ash that was deposited into the lake and then um, lithified. That was an idea that was um, suggested. Um, I think in my in my paper, the 2019 paper, and then in mm, the paper by the Kamin team as well in 2016. Um, so yeah, the dust component could have played a part in it, but I think looking at the ChemCam data, you get these kind of groupings in different um, stratigraphic intervals and so in different stratigraphic groups. Um, you definitely see that there are differences, overall differences in geochemistry that are characteristic of each stratigraphic group and they're different from each other. And I think that kind of supports changes, like big scale changes in dominant sediment source region. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much dust would have influenced things in the past, especially when it was warmer and wetter mm -hmm. um, and able to sustain a perennial river lake environment. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. But I think overall, just looking at the big scale changes in geochemistry, it does yeah, suggest like the, the dominant source region def definitely did change. And you do see like, like sanadine, the thing that I mentioned, has been concentrated in one unit, but we do actually see that throughout the traverse. So whatever this interesting source region was has contributed to the sedimentary mm -hmm. for a long time in Gale Crater, um, but just on a very small scale relative compared to what we see at the Kimberley formation. Um, so yeah, <laughs> source regions are difficult to mm -hmm. fully delineate from each other. And I definitely think I may like, I think there's more than what we can see, even using, like, even using the method that I kind of developed during my PhD. Um, Cause yeah, sediments are very messy. <laughs> but I think so long as you look at and you can identify the main dominant source regions, I think that's the most important one to try and understand. Um, and that can, yeah, that can then help you understand, like, if you, if you can geochemically characterize a unit or a stratigraphic unit, then if you see that geochemistry again, then that tells you something about, oh, you might be seeing this stratigraphic unit again. And why are you seeing this again? Is, could this mean that this same source region is coming into play? Or, um, yeah, and then that raises a whole new different set of questions. And you mentioned there uh, uh, the idea of a perennial uh, liquid on Mars for some period of time. How long, or do you have any inferences from your work you did with uh, the Curiosity of how long that will have been for? Unfortunately, no. Um, all we know is that we've gone through like 500, maybe 600 meters of mudstone now. There's been a lot of mudstone. Mm -hmm. And so this environment lasted for a long time. Mm -hmm, mudstone mm -hmm. doesn't accumulate at a quick rate, I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so this lake existed for a very long time. We see fluctuations in lake level. There's been some desiccation cracks seen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, an outcrop in the marine formation, but there aren't many. Um, we're seeing some gradual mineralogical changes as we go at Mount Sharp, which suggests um, changes in the environment. Like at the base, we saw more um, magnetite, which is a reduced iron oxide. And as we go up, and we saw like trioctahedral smectite, which you get in your more reduced um, alkaline settings. And as we're going up the Mount Sharp mudstone, we're seeing more hematite and more dioctahedral smectite, um, which suggests potentially more oxidizing conditions. 
Um, so we are seeing this interesting mineralogical change. Um, and yeah, there's been some sedimentary features to suggest um, that there's definitely been variations in lake level, but the lake has still been that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and the dunes, the ancient Aileen dune deposits that I've been analyzing with ChemCam, um, they came in way after all of Mount Sharp formed, and then mm -hmm. you had this um, wind erosion of Mount Sharp, and then the dunes formed then. So they lie what's called unconformably over the Mount Sharp group of stones. So they came, they are very, they're, they're probably one of the younger probably one of the youngest, um, I think they are the youngest in stratigraphic, um, like in situ deposit we've looked at so far. But that's because they came in way after the mudstone and the lake disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we've got the sulfate bearing unit still to go that potentially may have also formed in the lake setting. Um, so Mount Shark is mostly deposited in this kind of lake, envir lake environment. So yeah, it lasted for a long time. And there's also these like interesting features. I mean, the fact that Mount Sharp is also lithified suggests that and the fact that even the Stimson formation, these ancient alien dunes are now lithified. In order for something to be lithified, you need groundwater there or some kind of water rock interaction to cement the deposits. So even after this perennial like river lake environment ended, there was still water there to go through and cement Stimson formation. And we do see some alteration features in the Stimson formation too that suggests large scale water like them, yeah, water mobilization, like the silica rich halos mm. down at the Emerson and Narcos Plateau. So yeah, we think water's existed in Gale Crater for a long time. Um, can't say exactly when. It's difficult to date things precisely um, when you're so far away. And all you can really go on is the relative geological age. Um, yeah, it's been there for a long time. <laughs> Just kind of itself in itself, because Gale Crater formed um, the Noachian Hesperian boundary, and we think the climate started to get dry during the um, Hesperian. So, uh, um, sorry for the listeners, that's about 3.7 billion years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Gale Crater formed 3.5 to 3.2 billion years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we definitely think water has existed somehow in Gale Crater for mm. the majority of it at least for when the majority of the geological units formed, um, which is a long time. Hmm. Kind of, yeah, push, pushing our understanding of water on Mars, which is cool. Um, so what is next for Martian exploration then? Um, what exciting things are you looking forward to in the next few years? Well, I mean, Mars 2020, Perseverance Rovers flying this month, which is exciting, and it's gonna get there in February next year. So. Fingers crossed, all goes well, and then we'll be exploring a new part of part of Mars um, and Jezero Crater. Um, I've put in my bid to maybe be a participating scientist, but we'll see how that works out. Um, but hopefully, at least the research I'm doing in Iceland can help with that mission. Mm. Um, and in terms of what's next for Mars, so um, the work I did on the Stimson formation with MSL. Um, is kind of like, we, we might be encountering more of that as we go further with the rover. So um, I'm keeping a close eye on things with that and hoping that I can understand more about um, like ancient dune processes and um, aqueous alteration in the younger deposits um, as we go along with curiosity. But yeah, just trying to get a handle on this Icelandic sediment stuff and see how it compares. That's, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the final question that we ask all of our guests is um, if you could be doing something else completely different to this, either in academia or outside of it, what would you want to do? So, I, throughout my PhD, when stuff got hard, I always have a plan B, so I don't feel bad about if I fail. My, <laughs> my plan B is, I'm going to open like a hipster oatmeal coffee shop. Oh, no. so I, I love porridge. <laughs> Let's just end the episode, guys. <laughs> Thanks for being on, Candy. As well. <laughs> no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oatmeal and it's going to be called oatmeal, and the A is going to be a little heart. Oh, okay, right. Thanks for coming on. And I'm going to like get tattoos, and I'm going to write books, like write nonfiction, nonfiction, not fiction, no fiction. Yeah, that's the one. I'm going to write like, fiction stories, and just be like. I think you've thought a lot about this. You really planned this out. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, 
<laughs> like, no, so, things go wrong. And so this is what I'm going to do. Even though, kind of like, now I'm over here in Houston, it's really hot. I don't really, I haven't had much porridge since I've come out here. So main thing I've been doing during quarantine is I've now really got into bacon muffins. I love muffins. So maybe I would actually make it into a muffin and coffee shop. Wow. So it sounds like you haven't thought it through. You're flip-flopping so much. <laughs> Let's just hope this this Mars rover uh, return mission will work out for you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's my first choice, but yeah. it's always good to have this second option. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Well, I I speak for all of us, I guess, when I say thank you very much for coming on. Yes, yeah, indeed. Thank you. It's indeed. been very interesting. And um, hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Yeah, it was lovely chatting to you all. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, Candice, yeah, thank you very much. Um, but in the meantime, for all of you, if you want some more Earth and planetary science content, do check us out on all the social medias. Uh, from the Twitter to Facebook to Instagram, we're uh, everywhere at Earth Solar System. All the links will be in the episode description. And Candice, do you have uh, any plugs you want to put in? We can put them in the description. Um, I would just say if you want to follow what's going on in Iceland um, for the Sunday campaign, um, or at least if you just want beautiful drone imagery of Iceland, because we have lots of that in 360 videos then um yeah there's there was a lot of like if you just type in like hashtag sunday into twitter or follow mission control space services um they posted a lot of the sunday project so, brilliant yeah, well we'll put, we'll put some our... of that in the description and below as well mm -hmm. and uh, we'll plug your oatmeal and coffee shop as well if it doesn't work out i don't want anyone to my idea <laughs> yeah. though, though. <laughs> Please. I don't think it's an original idea. <laughs> we could test the market for it. If anyone of us is interested, uh, just be sure to tweet at us with the hashtag yeah. porridge. Hashtag <laughs> <laughs> oatmeal. I'm, I'm an American now. I've got to use that. Oh, <laughs> right, thank me. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. Bye bye. <laughs>